that I want to invite you to take out your message notes that are found right in your program, and we are continuing our journey through this important understanding of joy that is the centerpiece of the Christmas message. The verse that's on top of your notes is the inspiration of this series, Great Joy for All People. The angel came and announced to the shepherds this great joy, and he said, Do not be afraid, for behold, Luke 2.10, I bring you good tithings of great joy, which will be for all people. And so that joy for all people is also for all generations and for all circumstances. One thing is true is that in this life we will go through some bouts with doubts and some seasons of struggles, and we will find ourselves without question in the maze of confusion. It's in those times that happiness seems to be far and few between, and we begin to reach out and try to find some type of strong hope, some type of strong foundation. Well, that's joy. A good understanding of biblical joy, the joy that comes from the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, and of course the resurrection of Christ is this. It's right here in your notes. It's the secure and steadfast confidence that God is in control regardless of how adverse our circumstances may be. There are some of us as we approach another Christmas season that we have adverse circumstances under our own roof. We can have adverse circumstances in our home. We can have adverse circumstances in our heart. It's a part of who we are. If I go outside and you go outside while it's raining, guess what? We're both going to get wet. That's the same thing with circumstances. They're going to rain down. Difficult ones are going to rain down on us medically, financially, relationally. And it seems that during this time of the calendar year in our culture, the pain of those circumstances is enhanced just a little bit more. Now, what we need to know is this great joy for all people, this great joy of salvation is also our salvation, and it's joy that we can have in the midst of our difficult circumstances. Now, we're going to continue by looking at characters that were affected by this joy. Some of these characters you never hear about. As I mentioned last week with Simeon, we're going to be talking about this week, Anna, the prophet Anna, the prophetess Anna. Anna doesn't get a nativity figure, as you could see up, up over here, or under your tree or on your front lawn. But she's more connected to the Christmas story than even the three kings are. They came 18 months later. Anna and Simeon, they were introduced to the baby Jesus a few short weeks after Mary delivered the Lord. As was custom with their, their laws and their, their Jewish rituals and with the scripture prescribed of them after Mary's days of purification were completed, it was time to bring the baby to the temple to be dedicated too poor to afford the normal sacrifice, they gave two turtle doves. Now, what's interesting is the two people that they meet at the temple. I don't think it's a coincidence that they meet Simeon, who we were introduced to last week. The scripture says that God had promised to him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. We find out by studying the scriptures that he was very advanced in years, around 116 years of age, church history tells us. That's a, that's a pretty old man to be waiting. But yet he was waiting, and he had joy while he was waiting. But we're introduced to another character, and I'd like to read to you her story, Anna. It goes right with Simeon because she hears Simeon giving thanks for the birth of Jesus while he's holding the baby in his hands, and that prompts Anna from wherever she is to jump in the mix. So jumping here in Luke chapter 2, in verse 36 we start, it says, And there was a prophetess, Anna the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, Dr. Luke tells us, and had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. The scripture notes now that she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayer. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him, that being Jesus, to all those who were looking for the redemption of Israel. Thanks be to God for preserving this biblical and historical record for us this morning as we open it up. You know, when you think about Christmas, it's easy to get caught up in all the presents and parties and the cards and the activities. It seems that Christmas gets pushed up earlier each year. 
uh, shopping malls and retailers. Uh, obviously, they want to finish in the black at the end of the year, but you know, it used to be after Thanksgiving, that was Christmas, then obviously Black Friday, and now malls start doing things as early as the beginning of November. But even with the advanced notice of Christmas, it seems that we lose the meaning of Christmas, or at least the understanding of it more each year. And it's great to come around this understanding of great joy as we look at this character here, Anna, and who she represents and what she's about, how in her difficult circumstances, she has great joy. And so let's meet this character. It says, and there was a prophetess, Anna. Now, we know in the Old Testament, there are five other women who were prophets. And we don't know how much they prophesied. Maybe it was just one time. But Anna joins them here as we cross over into the New Testament. And she is one, a prophet means is somebody who who tells what's going to happen before it happens on behalf of God. They speak on behalf of God. And so Anna is given to these prophetic utterances, and it says that she was the daughter of Phanel. Now, you're going to want to circle Anna's name. And you'll notice in your notes, the name Anna is very significant to the context of the Christmas story. The name Anna means to be gracious, or God is gracious. Very important, so circle her name. And then her father's name is Phanel, which means face of God. God is showing us something here in these two characters. I mean, her father could have been anybody, right? It could have been Mo, Larry, or Curly, I guess, right? But no, it's Finel, and his name means face of God. In the Old Testament, when it says that Jacob wrestled with God, he saw the face of God, he, Finel, that's the, the Hebrew word there. And so Anna God is gracious, or to be gracious, Fennel, the face of God. God wants us to know, as she is coming in contact, she hears Simeon giving thanks because Simeon is holding the baby Jesus. He's praising God and says, now I could die because I have held and seen salvation. Anna hears this. We know she's in the temple night and day. She hears this. She comes into the presence of where Simeon is, and we're hearing all of this. And what's now the scene is, is the face of God is gracious. God wants us to know something about that. The scripture says that she was also from the tribe of Asher. Now, one of the 10 tribes of the Northern Kingdom as we study the Old Testament, but Asher was known for their beautiful women. So if you were looking to get married, you wanted to go find the tribe of Asher, I guess, guys. And church history tells us that these women were so beautiful that they were known to be fit for kings. They were beautiful and classy. And I think that says something about Anna. It says something because just like Joseph and Mary, who we will begin to unpack over the next two weeks leading into Christmas and Christmas morning, just as those two characters reflect the heart of God, so does Simeon and Anna. Because God wants us to know he's gracious. God wants us to know that his very face, when we seek his face, we are seeking a face of grace. Now, that's an important message this time of the year. If you've gone shopping or you've gone gift wrapping and you've had the pleasure of going into a parking lot in December, people are anything but gracious. I had to remind somebody just the other day that their name wasn't printed in the pavement of the, of the parking lot. Some people think, that's my spot, you know, is where I park. It's amazing how people get during this time of the year. We're anything but gracious, but God is gracious. And what we must remember as we are being faithful in whatever God has taken us through, we must remain this way. Because the scripture says she was advanced in years and that she lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Now in their custom, they were married by 15. So let's do the math. She got married at 15, like Mary. Married for seven years, her husband dies. That's not the ideal marriage, we understand that. So she's 22. The correct interpretation of this 84 years means that she lived 84 years after her husband died. So do the math. She's around 106 years old. Simeon's 116. She's 106. This is some fellowship they got going here. And so they're very advanced in years, and you would think a woman who lost her husband in, in her young years would be bitter at God, but she's not, because perhaps she saw in her own father, by his very name, the face of God, that God is gracious. And I think there's two challenges here. One, you want to write this down in your notes. As you're being faithful, 
regardless of your grief that you might be going through, like Anna, or your difficulties with another family member or a struggle. Remember to be faithful by reflecting God's heart. We must reflect God's heart. If you're going to have the joy of the Lord in your life, you can't reflect what everybody else is doing. You can't reflect how evil people act and the mistreatment that they try to do. That we got to be people who reflect God, reflect his heart. It's a contradiction of terms to say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to treat everybody like garbage. It doesn't work that way. No matter where we are, we are called to represent Christ. In fact, the scripture says we are Christ's representatives. We are his ambassadors. Well, the best way to represent Christ is by reflecting the heart of God. Again, it's no accident that we have Simeon and now we have Anna. These two characters are very much step in step with Mary and Joseph in how their posture is towards God. We read last week that Simeon was righteous and devout. He was righteous with other people. He treated people right. And he was devout, meaning that he wasn't sloppy with his relationship with God. He was committed to God. Anna's the same way. And it makes sense because God wouldn't have two bums raise his kids. That's why he chose two of the greatest characters on the face of the earth, Mary and Joseph, to raise Jesus. And then as Jesus is being presented in the temple, if you will, these are God-parent-type figures, Simeon and Anna. They represent the heart of God. And so Anna represents the face of God, the understanding that God is gracious, that God understands that God's grace is limitless. And it's such an important message for us to hold on to, that we must reflect the heart of God. And sure, there are going to be some sticky situations that we're going to be put into that we may not want to answer the call, but we have to. I heard the story about Norman Vincent Peale's father, Clifford. His father was a preacher, and he was a very caring man. And Norman Peale went on to be a faithful minister. And one day when he was 10 years old, his father got a call at the house from the local brothel that there was a woman who worked there that was dying. And this prostitute requested the minister to come because she wanted to make peace with God. And so he said to his 10-year-old son, Norman, hey, go get your coat on. We got a pastoral ministry visit to make. Now, his wife nearly fell out of her chair. You're taking our son where? And he said to her very clearly, that I got to go, and Norman needs to see that God's mercy could reach anyone. And I thought that that was very powerful, because we have a habit, even in church, even where the cross is present, of judging everybody. We have a habit of holding people's head under the water over things that they've done. We have a habit of rubbing people's sins in their face when we need to be pointing to the one who rubbed the sins out. That's what we need to be about. And sure, we can judge everybody else, but we got to look at our own heart. we got to reflect the heart of God. And my friends, the heart of God is grace. People want to make the gospel so many other things, but it's not. The Christmas story is that for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And Anna to be gracious, God is gracious. Her father, the face of God. God's face is gracious. If you want to seek the face of God, which should be your prayer, if you want to seek God, you're seeking a God of grace. You're seeking a God of grace. And what that means for you and I is that we need to be people of grace. We need to show people grace. We've been given much, and to whom much is given, much is expected. And so for this woman's life, 84 years after losing her husband, a woman who was faithful, reflecting the things of God. Write this second principle down in your notes. When we talk about being faithful, it's so important that we don't miss this. We reflect God's heart, absolutely. And secondly, be faithful by honoring God with your time. Now, let me give you a quiz. I'll give you the answer, by the way. How do you spell time? L-O-V-E. And how do you spell love? T-I-M-E. Where you place your time says a lot about what you love. And obviously at the top of that list should be family and friends. We understand that. But it should also be our faith. It should be God. 
Listen to what it says about Anna. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayer. That's a common combination in the Old Testament, people with deep reverent prayer and fasting. Now, notice fasting is not commanded in the Bible, but it's mentioned an awful lot. It's implied, if you will. And in the scriptures, people would fast, denying themselves of food so that they could have a greater dependence and focus on God, whether it be for answers, for clarification, for wisdom, for guidance, whether it be to overcome a situation, whatever it might be, there was fasting that accompanied the prayers. In fact, if you are physically able to, I encourage you, you could fast. You know, there's this misconception that the only time you fast in the Northeast is during Lent. Well, the The Bible doesn't mention Lent, first of all. And second of all, we got to fast for more than something like chocolate and cartoons. We're not fasting just to get a merit badge. Sometimes we just need to fast because we feel distance in our relationship with God. Maybe we are not seeking God's gracious face. Uh, Maybe we're seeking so many other things and we got to kind of circle the wagons and get back on track with God. Maybe we have some difficulties. And so we want to honor God. And that's what's going on here. Anna is faithful in honoring God. And it says that she's doing it with prayers and with fasting. And she's committed. Now, she could have easily been bitter towards God. God took my husband. How can this be? I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Anna wasn't there. Anna knew that God was gracious, even in the midst of tragedy. And in her faith, she believed that just like Job in the resurrection, she had a firm understanding, no doubt, of the Old Testament and the promises of the Messiah. And so she had a fervent hope. She had a steadfast confidence. She had a joy. And so what we have to realize is is that we're going to have adverse circumstances, but that isn't a whole pass just to forget God and do whatever we want. We want to remain faithful. In fact, that's one of the most important qualities that you can have in this life, that you just want to be faithful to God. God hasn't called anybody to be famous. He's called us to be faithful. God hasn't called anybody to be some superstar Christian. By the way, there is no such person. He hasn't called you to be flawless. He's called you to be faithful to God, and that is what he requires of us, and we do that by honoring God, and that's exactly what Anna is doing. She's committed to the things of God. She knows that God's face is a face of graciousness. And she knows that she must be committed. Now, this word serving, you want to underline in your notes. The word serving means to worship. It means to honor. That is what Anna's doing. She's honoring God with her life. And that's what we need to do. Now, what do we usually say? Well, if I only had more time, I could give more time to God. How many have ever shopped at JCPenney's? Anybody? How many of you are going to shop for my Christmas gift at J.C. Penney's? Just, no, I'm just kidding. There's other stores I like. I like J.C. Penney's too. But J.C. Penney, who was blessed to have uh, believing parents, and he himself uh, became a believer in Jesus Christ, said this one time, if a man's business requires so much of his time that he cannot attend the services of his church, then that man has more business than God intended him to have. And sometimes we could get so busy with so many things that we think are good, and they are good. But remember, the enemy of good is what? No, the enemy of great is what? Good. God has great things for you and I. But sometimes we're so caught up on, on, I got to do all these good things, and we're missing out on the great things that God has for us. It is God's will that you and I would be people that would be committed to his will and his way, that we would honor him in such a way, that we would give him the first fruits of our time. It's so important that we realize that. And whether it is going to church, whether it is praying, whether it is serving, whether it is giving, whatever it may be, that God wants us to know that there's joy when you're faithful in those things. So you may have heard from people, oh, you know what? And I'm sure Anna got some, some pushback. Oh, you're going to that temple again? The God you pray to, he took your husband. What kind of God is that? You may have people like that in your life. They're killjoys. They want to kill your joy. You have this joy in God, and you're making time for God. You're trying to live for God, and you got people that try to talk you out of your relationship with God. Don't believe a word of it. Either they're jealous or ignorant or a little bit of both. What you must realize is the best place for you is in the house of God and is seeking the face of God. Because if you're not seeking the face of God, you're going to be seeking a lot of other things. And that's going to hurt when you go through trouble. 
We already know how foolish we are and how stupid we are. We don't anybody remind us of that. I think we could all, could you agree on that and say amen? We all know that, okay? What we must realize then is we must be committed then in seeking the face of God so that when there is trouble, when there is fallbacks and setbacks and so forth and on, we don't just fall by the wayside, that we are seeking the face of God, and we do that. We do that by reflecting the heart of God and by honoring God by giving him your time. Now, in my 20 years of preaching and counseling people and throw in that now 15 years of pastoring, I've never met, not one time, I've never fielded a phone call, an email, a Facebook message, or an in-person meeting of somebody who said, man, I regret giving God my time. Not one time. Never met one person say, man, I really regret going to church to God. I really regret giving my time to God. Now, you might have regretted people who didn't act the right way. And I'm sure Anna was well aware of the hypocrisy of the temple. I mean, who couldn't miss it? There's hypocrites everywhere. Don't stop going to church because you meet a hypocrite. Because then you're being a hypocrite by doing that. Hypocrites everywhere. We got to help hypocrites get right with God. We understand that. But don't stop going to church just because you meet a hypocrite or two. You go to church to worship and honor God. We don't go to church for how cool or how hot it is in the building, of how nice the seat may be, of how nice the music may be, or how nicely groomed. By the way, I shaved yesterday, okay, just so you know. It'd take me six more days to get a little more hair on my face. I'm a, I'm a very unhairy Italian, as you know, okay. <laughs> but no, all that stuff is ancillary. I joke because those are the things people look at. Over the years, I've had conversations with people, uh, nonsense things. And that just shows that you're not seeking the face of God. And when you're not seeking the face of God, you're not going to reflect the heart of God. And when you're not reflecting the heart of God, and when you're not honoring God with your time, it's going to be hard to have the joy of the Lord. This is not a condemning message, because I need to hear this too. I need to remember to reflect God, because I'm a parent. Fennel reflected God's face to his daughter. That's a challenge for us fathers and us mothers that are here today. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes my children drive me nuts. Is it okay to say that? Okay. I was talking with somebody the other day. Their kid's a little bit older, and he was telling me the problems that, not problems, but, the, you know, the daily things of raising children. I went, aye, 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 okay. Man, I thought it was going to get easier. And even in those difficulties, as a parent, when your children do the wrong thing, it's so hard to, you have to fight back to be mean. Now, you don't want to be mean-spirited. You want to be gracious. The face of God, gracious. We want to reflect God that way. And we want to honor him with our time so that we could fill our heart with as much of his word as possible. You know, Psalm 119, 11, the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119 says, I have hidden your word in the back seat of my car till next Sunday. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> I've hidden your word on Facebook so people can think I'm spiritual. No, don't say that. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's lots of positive talk out there. I realize that. There's lots of books we can read that can puff our chest out. But the only thing that can change our hearts is the word of God. We must realize that. And the word of God became flesh in Jesus Christ. See, the whole birth of Christ is God with us, and these characters have been arranged in such a way. God has put them on the scene of history. Who, again, just think about what we've taught about this, these past three weeks together. Zacharias and Elizabeth, the obscurity, nobody knew about them. But God chose Zacharias because of what he represented. God chose Elizabeth. God chose Joseph and Mary. God chose Simeon. God chose Anna. Nobody knew these characters. But who they were, who they were seeking, tells a lot. And it brings to life God with us. Because Jesus would, would encompass all of those things. And as it were, their lives, they were not... They were not dispensers of grace as some people try to make these characters to be. 
They were recipients of God's grace. And therefore, they were reflecting the work of God. And we must do the same. The best thing for your marriage is to give God your time. The best thing for your home is to give God your time. The best thing, if you're struggling right now and you've, had, you've made a mess of things right now, you made a lot of wrong turns, God is gracious. The best thing for you is to get with God. You know, the enemy, when before you knew the Lord, you could get to those places of sin with no problem, right? Man, all green lights on Highland Boulevard or wherever you're traveling from. I'll pick you up. I'll take you there. Hey, you need a, I'll spot you something. No problem. But the things of God, sometimes the excuses pop up. And we start making excuses. Listen, you want to honor God and you want to reflect God. That will produce a joy in your heart, the joy of the Lord. And there's no doubt, there's no doubt that Anna has this. I mean, think about our day. There's 24 hours in a day. There's 1,440 minutes in a day. And there's 86,400 seconds. Every one of those numbers is precious. They are a gift from God. The Bible says pray without ceasing. You could pray throughout the day. As we've said before, prayer isn't a phone call. Hey, God, it's Ray. How you doing? Yeah, if you could, bye -bye. okay, goodbye. I'll talk to you later. Amen. And you hang up the phone. I'll, I'll talk to him later. Don't, you can have a continuous conversation with God throughout the day. But what fuels that is the scriptures. You know, Anna's name is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Hannah in the Old Testament. What poured out of Hannah's heart? Scripture. What poured out of Mary's heart? Scripture. We know more about Anna than we even do about Simeon, given her circumstances. And by way of the fact that she is there night and day, what this tells us is that Scripture is in her heart as well. She is committed to honoring the things of God, and so should we. Turning over your notes, notice what Psalm 86, 12 through 13 says. A verse to commit to memory this week. I will give thanks to you, notice, with all my heart. Not with some of my heart. With all of my heart, O oh Lord, my God. I will honor you forever. Could I just pause for a second? Go home tonight and pray this verse. Get on your knees. You might have to go in the bathroom because everybody's bothering you. Go in the bathroom. Sometimes I go in the bathroom and I run the water. I know my water bill's getting high because of that. That's the only I get. I, I'm busy in here. Okay, flushed the toilet a few times. Leave me alone. But I'm on the knee. I'm on my knees. That's sometimes the only place you can go. Get on your knees tonight. I don't care where it is, the bathroom, the basement. I don't care where you got to go outside. Pretend you're fixing the lights. I don't care what you got to do. And say, Lord, I want to give thanks to you with all my heart. All my heart. There is something powerful about getting on your knees if you're physically able to. As uh, one old missionary once said, if you see me on my knees, it doesn't mean I'm weak. It just means I'm getting stronger. There's something powerful. I will give thanks to you with all my heart, O oh Lord my God, and make this command. God, I want to honor you. I know I'm going to fail in this at times, but God, is, it, I want to honor you forever. Till you call me home, I want to be like Anna. And I bet you at 106, it felt like forever. And I bet you at 116 for Simeon, it felt like forever. But I will honor you, if, if you, Lord, if you bless me to live to 106, I will honor you. You know, I have some life goals, and one of them, I want to hit triple digits in my life. And I, and I ask the Lord that I would be in control of all my faculties, and I never want to retire from the ministry. I just want one day when I'm about 120, that one day, he's, not, he's gone. He's not here anymore. Okay, great. He lived a full life, okay? Uh, now, as some of you may know, I, I go to the eye doctor uh, regularly, uh, you know, every two years for my appointment, and the eye doctor knows uh, what I do, and, and he said, the last eye checkup, he said, man, this is remarkable. He goes, your eyesight's getting better. And then he said it again the last time, and he says, already, he goes, you need to understand something. At, you know, as I could see your eyes, your whole life, you'll never need a Bible up close. You'll never need glasses for your Bible in the pulpit up close. So I said, well, that's a good thing then. Maybe that's fitting along with my goal. But hey, you aim for the moon, you hit the lamppost, okay? So maybe not 120, maybe 101, I don't know. But the point is, is however long the Lord gives us, we want to say, Lord, I just want to honor you for whatever my forever is. We know in heaven we'll be honoring him. It's so tough here. Now, you get a lot of people that say, I'd die for Jesus if, I, if a gun was put to my head. Well, most of us, 
prayerfully, most of us will never be put in that situation. But all of us have been put in a situation to live for God. Focus on living for him. Verse 13, because your mercy toward me is great, you have rescued me from the depths of hell. Isn't that the truth? What fuels our reflection of God and the willingness to honor God is to understand the depths in which we were saved from. Remember in Revelation chapter 2, where John was recording, the, the pro, recording ultimately the prophecies of the book of Revelation, and it says very clearly there, have you forgotten the height from which you have fallen? You've forsaken your first love. A lot of times, even though we can never lose our salvation, we can lose sight of it. But Anna is hearing Simeon say, salvation is here. She's seeing all of this, and there's no doubt that she's echoing in her life, Psalm 86. And so we want to reflect the heart of God. We want to honor God with our time. And then write this last principle down before we close. We want to be faithful to God. Anna, faithful. 106 years. I would say that's faithful. We want to be faithful by sharing God's message. Share God's message of joy. We live in a very, very, very evil world. And on top of that, there are people with their own difficult circumstances. You know, going into our second week now of wrapping gifts, I've already had conversations with people who have lost a spouse, who have lost a child, who have aggressive cancer, who have aggressive pulmonary disease. It's amazing. And that's one of the reasons why, if you say, man, why in the world we wrap gifts for? Paper cuts, waste my time, people are annoying. Yes, we know people are annoying. Guess what? Some people think you're annoying, and some people think I'm annoying. But there are people who we need to meet to encourage. And if it's just to plant a seed, if it's just to pray. In fact, I have, my, I have it upstairs. I have on my phone a prayer list that I'm taking with people. And there are people who, who are praying because they may not see the, the, the end of next year. There are people with adverse circumstances, and there are people here with adverse circumstances. And it's in that that we need to realize we need this message of joy. And on top of those are people who are living in adverse circumstances around the world. Even in New York, the things that go on, everything from human trafficking to the drug pandemic locally, there is evil all around us. And there is a need for the message of joy. Now, notice what it says here as we close off Anna. Anna, who means gracious. And it says, and she continued to speak of him. This word speak in the Greek language, lielo, means to declare one's mind, to convey, to share. And she continued to share of him, of Jesus, to all those who were looking for, rede for the redemption of Israel. This is a powerful theological statement here. The redemption of Israel, they're thinking, they're thinking of the sacrifices. They're, they're thinking of the Messiah that's going to come, but on their terms. But she's proclaiming a greater redemption, which she is saying is that the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant, and of course, the new covenant is here. Simeon is saying all of that as well when he said that this baby is the joy joy of Israel. Why is that? Because previously Israel's joy was their sacrifices, but now the greatest sacrifice of all has come because he was born to die. You can't have a redemption without a ransom being paid. And so what she's saying, in essence, you can translate this to say, for all those who are looking for their souls to be ransomed, for all those who are looking for the penalty of sin to be paid in full, for all those who are looking for the curse of sin to be eradicated. This is what she was sharing. She was sharing this message so that all could know. And God wants you and I to do the same. He wants you and I to be connected the same way with this great joy, that this isn't just another Christmas season where we arrange the nativity figures. There's great significance in each of these characters and what they represent. They all point to the centerpiece of the message that redemption has come. You know, if you've come here today and maybe you got invited here and somebody promised you, you know, they'll take you out to eat or they'll take you shopping or something like that, um, I hope they fulfill their promise because that's not good to lie and, and come to church. We understand that. And you might be wondering, what am I doing in here, this old theater? Now it's a church. What are they going to do? And I think you've seen so far that everything is just the way it needs to be, that God is speaking to your heart. And if you 
are a believer in Jesus Christ, but you've went backwards for whatever reason because of bad decisions, habits, and strongholds. The enemy wants you to think there is no hope. But this Christmas, you need to know there's tremendous hope. There's great joy, even in the midst of your difficulties and your strongholds, that by God's grace, this message of redemption, this is the message here. It's more than just tinsels and toys and stockings. It's much more than that, that God wants you to know this message is going to pull you out. This redemption, as you plug your heart in, as you embrace this redemption and understand the depths of God's love that he's gracious and forgiving, this has the very power to pull you out of that hole that you are in. If you've come here today and you were trusting in religion or your good deeds to get you to heaven, no one ever went to heaven because of a religion or a religious record. Heaven is guaranteed for those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. Just as Anna said, the redemption of Jesus. Even if you're here today, your parents brought you here. You can't get to heaven on your parents' dime, as nice as they might be with the Lord. you got to have your own faith in Christ. Uh, no, you're never too young to put your faith in Christ. And you're never too old. Today is the day of salvation, and God wants you to know this message of redemption. And if you are an Anna here today... You don't have to be 106, but maybe you feel like 106, right? Yeah, I guess as you get older, our life becomes the story of the Rice Krispies, snack, crackle, and pop when you get up and you try to get going, right, each day. But you don't got to just be 106 to feel that way. You could be living for the Lord and trying to do the right thing, and you just keep getting hit with one thing after another on top of your physical illnesses, and you're just, man, let me, let me just give you a geographical picture here. They didn't have escalators at the temple. Do we understand that? There were steps to walk up. This woman didn't have a taxi or a Uber driver take her to the temple. She probably lived in an apartment very close to the temple by way of the Greek construction of the language here. She got up each day at 106. Prior to that, 105, you get the understanding. And she walked up the stairs. And I get the understanding that as she probably walked up the stairs, maybe she got halfway through and said, oh boy, Lord, She kept walking up those stairs. She kept walking because it was important that she would honor God, that she would reflect God, and as we could see, that she would share God. And so what am I saying to you as we close, for all of us? Don't think for one second that you living and doing the right thing for God is insignificant because it's not. We live in a church age where everybody wants a show. People want to come to church and be entertained. It's more than that, and thank God that's the case. Because we could be entertained. That's why it says, for unto us, a child it doesn't say for unto us an entertainer's born so we could be entertained till we drop dead and go to hell. It doesn't say that. For unto us, a sports star is, is born so we can watch somebody play sports and then drop dead. It doesn't say that. For unto us, a Savior is born, who is Christ the Lord. And we could be faithful till the Lord calls us home. Be faithful with the little, be faithful with the much, whatever it is, we be faithful to God. We be faithful by reflecting, by honoring, and by sharing this great message. This is the true understanding of Christmas. This is God's will for you and I. And so keep being faithful. Keep walking up those stairs like Anna. No matter how tired you are, no matter how difficult it is, don't believe the lies from the enemy that you're nothing, you're not going to, don't believe any of that or you're too old. You keep walking for God. You keep climbing those steps for God. With each step will come more joy. And you will get to where you need to be, which is as she was to seek the face of God. And as I mentioned earlier, there will be no regret for any of the steps that you walk up for God in this life. And one day, my friends, one day, we will worship in the presence of God at his throne. And all of those adverse circumstances, all of those difficulties will not be worth, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, 17, will not be worth comparing with the glory that awaits us in heaven. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace, oh God. We thank you that your face is gracious. We thank you that your mercy is limitless. 
And we thank you that salvation is here, just like Simeon held in his hand. Lord, we can hold it in our hearts. The Messiah, the redemption has come. Lord, we thank you for the true joy. We don't want a temporary joy. We want an eternal joy that comes from you. And so, God, I pray a blessing over each one of my brothers and sisters that are here or watching at home. Lord, I pray for your covering, God. I pray for the person that feels that they're far, far away to let them know, oh, God, that that you love them and that you are gracious. I pray for the person that is being faithful and whether they're serving you and their family and their job and working hard and they're getting a lot of slack, a lot of unwarranted criticism, whatever it may be, God, I pray that you just encourage them to keep on keeping on. And Lord, for all of us, I pray that we would make the center of our life to honor you with how we live our life, how we treat others, and all that we do, oh God. Lord, there is joy for those who are faithful like Anna. Help us to remember this great example. We commit these prayers and we sow them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.